Uh, yes, I'm so excited to be here today uh, and talk with people who are making this work happen and share some of the exciting things that are going on and some of the overview of the project and where, we're, where we work and what we do. So thanks so much for having me and, and Bethany. And let's get started talking about saving rainforests with a stethoscope. So as everybody here knows, there are so many different ways that we have been trying as a global community to protect and conserve rainforests through the years, from buying lands to signing petitions to uh, conservation education. And this is all with very good reason, as we're learning more all the time about how important rainforest is for our global climate and for global health. So deforestation world over is contributing about 15% of emissions to the atmosphere. And we saw last year in Indonesia how much of an ecological crisis deforestation can cause with thousands of fires raging across the country after deforestation had really made it just a tinderbox. And this picture is actually taken by our communication manager. And this is from the car as she's driving to Sukadana, our program site. And all of this is smoke. You can't even see the car in front of you because of how smoky it is. And Indonesia actually became the world's largest emitter last year, even though it's the 10th largest economy. So not only is deforestation bad for our planet, but it's bad for human health as well. Last summer, we saw how widespread fires can lead to respiratory problems. And our clinic saw a 40% increase in respiratory aggravated conditions just in the fire season. But even beyond respiratory issues, deforestation has been linked to everything from malaria and dengue to the Ebola crisis and even now Zika. So I just want to quickly say this is Gunung Palung National Park, where we work. And Gunung Palung is, in addition to being a major carbon sink and very important for the health and the water cycle of the local community, it's just a biodiversity treasure. It's 265,000 plus square feet, or square, square feet, acres, and uh, it's home to 2,500 orangutans, Bornean orangutans, and was recently declared critical to the survival of the overall species. So this is a very, very unique place with uh, very unique, very unique animals. Um, in addition to orangutans, there are seven distinct ecosystems in this park that are actually representative of all of the vegetation within Borneo, just in this one, this one park. There's also 178 different bird species and several other endangered large mammals and other species, including gibbons, sun bears, proboscis monkeys, pangolins, tarsiers, and many others. So what many people don't know about Gunung Palung National Park is that the people who live around it are very aware of what makes it special and what makes it important. However, unfortunately, there are very few economic alternatives when people need to pay for something like health care, other than illegally logging in the park. For example, there's one man that we know, Pak Sofian, who had to cut down 60 huge rainforest trees to pay for one operation for his mother. So when it comes to caring for a sick child or another loved one, any of us would do almost anything to pay for that care even if it means threatening long-term well-being with something like cutting down trees in the rainforest. So this is a no-win situation, and it's one that people find themselves in all over the world, um, compromising long-term well-being for immediate short-term needs like, like paying for health care. So this is what our founder, Dr. Kinnery Webb, found in the 90s when she was studying orangutans in Gunung Palung National Park. And 10 years ago, people were, were hopeless. They felt trapped. Illegal logging was everywhere and healthcare was very poor. But we found win-win solutions for the people, for our planet, and for the wildlife that depends on this place. So this is where we work. This is a map of Southeast Asia and we are at this little red dot here on the west side of Borneo. And then this is a, a zoom in of Gun Gunung Palung National Park. Sukadana is where we are based out of here but we actually partner with all of these villages. When the ASU program began, it started with our founders going to each and every one of these villages, having more than 400 hours of community meetings, and employing a practice that we call radical listening. So in every meeting, we ask people, what is it that you need to protect the forest? And remarkably, people in every village said the same two things, which I'll get to in a moment. 
But what makes this process radical, in our opinion, is that we actually use the feedback to design programs. And we believe that this is one of the reasons that we've been able to be successful in this area. Um, from our community surveys, we knew that people cared about protecting this park but didn't have the resources to do so. And we've always seen our job as connecting people with those resources that they asked for. And we also continue to use, to seek out and use community feedback to design and change programs over time. So the first thing that people were asking for in these community meetings was access to high quality and affordable health care. So the first challenge around that is making it high quality. And the way that we do that is working with talented and enthusiastic young Indonesian doctors who are directly out of their medical school training. And they work with volunteers from institutions like Yale and Stanford, other universities and, and medical institutions that come from all over the world to work and train at, at Osri. So pictured here, for example, is Dr. Iwan and Dr. Nomi. And Dr. Nomi is our head of clinic. And Dr. Iwan is from Stanford University. And she's actually learning in this picture from Dr. Nomi how to use this ultrasound machine. <laughs> And uh, even further than that, we work with these partners to do observerships in the United States for our doctors. So Ewan and Dr. Nomi were also able to work together here in the United States at Stanford. One of my favorite things about the volunteer program is that our volunteers come in a training capacity. And in Indonesia, the, the quality of medical training can be highly variable across the country. And you have your four-year medical school that is primarily book-based, book textbook and classbook, classroom-based. And then you have to pay for your own residency. So there's often a gap between medical school and residency when you get your hands-on training. But during that time, you can still practice. And so our volunteers who come over and work in the clinic play a critical role in making sure that the quality of, of healthcare is really world-class. Now, care at Osri only costs a few dollars but we are never going to turn anybody away for their inability to pay. So we have alternative payment options that people can bring in things and barter for their health care with things that we can use in our conservation activities. For example, this woman here is bringing seedlings that th we then used in reforestation. Other people will bring manure that we can use in our farmers cooperatives and even handicrafts that we can sell and, and use that to pay for, for the care that people are receiving. So this is just one of the many ways that we really tie together the health of the environment with the health of people and make win-win solutions. And then finally, if a patient's coming from a village that is not engaged in illegal logging, they'll receive a 70% discount at the clinic, which is another way of um, incentivizing that conservation and making sure that there's a, a social pressure and a social engagement around reducing logging. And in this way, people like Paxofian can put down their chainsaws but still access high quality care for their families. So then the second thing that people asked for in these community meetings that started our program was other livelihood options, particularly sustainable farming. The traditional method of agriculture in this area is slash and burn, where you cut down one piece of rainforest, um, use that patch of soil until it's kind of devoid of all nutrients, and then move on which worked pretty well in this area when there was a lot of rainforest that could regenerate itself and not a lot of people. But now, Borneo has seen some of the fastest deforestation rates in the world, and there's a lot more people in this area. So everyone was very interested in learning about a method of farming where you could stay in one place but also not use expensive chemical inputs that they couldn't necessarily afford. So we were able to bring in experts from Java in sustainable and organic farming and have now trained more than 500 farmers in 16 different cooperatives. We also have two different reforestation sites uh, that both employ former loggers and restore the forest. And as many of you probably know, restore, reforesting a rainforest is a particularly difficult endeavor. A lot of young rainforest trees have not evolved to be resistant to fire because rainforests have never had to be resistant to fire before, and so that makes them very vulnerable. So Osri's reforestation plots have employed a variety of experimental me methods and then rigorously tested and evaluated those to see what works, and, as well as employing a lot of fire safety measures as well. 
Um, but for example, we have a, a test plot that is, is a control plot, so we didn't plant anything there, we didn't do anything there. And now that plot is full of invasive grasses and ferns and little else, and it would just, it would go up in a second. But our other test plots now actually have closed canopy, so we're really seeing some, some benefit from these different types of methods that we've been attempting. Osteries also started a family entrepreneurship program in the last year to work with the final remaining loggers in the area to find an alternative for their family that will work. And this largely involves seed funding for um, either a side business or a main business um, to grow or start something new that will work as an economic alternative. We also have a livestock management program. This is one of my favorite pictures of a woman and just how happy she is with her goats. We started um, a Goats for Widows program. The communities came to us and asked for something that would help their most vulnerable members. And we together came up with Goats for Widows. But this is also a great example of how a volunteer can be particularly useful. One of our now board members, Dr. Uh, Jeff Wyatt from the Seneca Park Zoo has gone over three times for just a few days at a time and trained our program manager, Ibu Setiawati, to um, do a variety of interventions that really have helped the herd. Um, the, at the beginning, this program was only working so well. There was a lot of illness, there was a lot of die-off, there wasn't a lot of reproduction, so widows weren't able to pass on goats to other women in their communities. But after some of Jeff's visits, he has trained and certified two of our program managers to um, look at body conditioning scoring, to look at anemia and hoof trimming, and then guiding women on, on how to better care for their goats, provide, provide better access to food and water and minerals and exercise, and then also using some selective deworming to really um, target where it's going to be most effective and not lead to drug resistance. So I just have to point out this picture. This, I love this woman, Ibu Tia, who will just put a goat on her back and on her motorbike and take off down the road to, <laughs> to, take, this, to take this goat to some, to some widow. And then she's getting down in her bike helmet and inspecting and hoof trimming and everything. She's a pretty, I mean, she's a pretty powerful go-getter woman. And she's worked with Dr. Jeff very closely. So then in the last visit, which just happened in the last couple weeks, he sent me this slide last night um, about how body condition has changed over the years. Um, so they've seen an increased availability of grass, water, and minerals, increased calf health, and increased reproduction. Um, so anemia scores, you can see the anemia scoring tool that they use up here. Um, anemia scores have improved and let's see that happened first due to husbandry improvements and nutrition and then in this last visit the deworming has been shown to be really effective as well um, and you can just see the body condition scores and how those have improved from how many we were seeing emaciated in the initial initial visit in 2013 and now we're seeing a much larger percentage of healthy goats in 2016. So he, he likes to say that he's accomplished his mission in making himself irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And he's almost not needed when he goes over now. Um, but he also shared that in addition to just improved herd health, the widows are really seeing an economic benefit from this. You know, this is an area where a lot of people live on less than $2 a day, and a widow can sell a goat for up to $180. So that's about a quarter of your year right there from one goat. And one woman was even, a, even able to put a new roof on her house just from selling goats. And then I want to talk quickly before we talk about how else some of the other indicators that have improved, talk about Osri Kids, because this is where Blank Park Zoo has been so effective and so helpful to us. Um, so this is a picture of kids in the rainforest, which is an opportunity that they would have otherwise probably not had. And they're learning here from our reforestation manager about different types of tree species and different types uh, or different methods of planting and how to take care of and nurture your own trees. So he's quizzing them right here about different types of tree species after they've spent the day together in the forest learning and planting and looking at different things. In addition to this, um, Etty, our, our wonderful, amazing teacher that you guys have met and supported, 
Um, she goes into classrooms on a weekly basis, teaches about recycling, climate change, species, um, geography even, and, and then takes the kids into the forest and even the highest achievers get to go and see an orangutan preserve at the end of the year in the summer and really see these animals up close and personal and understand that they are protectors of a resource that matters to the whole world. So now, did this approach work? Let's talk first about healthcare indicators. We did a baseline survey in 2005, uh, 2007 and talked to about 1,500 households and then repeated this survey after five years and saw decreases in everything from 18% of infant mortality, which is pretty unheard of, and then seeing other disease indicators like fever, diarrhea, and cough all also decreasing while things like childhood immunizations were increasing. But not only did we see health increase in this area, but logging decreased. So when we started, we had about 1,350 loggers and now have less than 200 in this area that we know individually and personally and can work with, um, such as the family entrepreneurship program that I was talking about where we can really individually find something that's going to work. And over, over the same time period in Indonesia as a whole, we actually saw an increase in logging. So we have strong evidence that this program is, is doing something right and is working for this community. So more than 52% of former loggers have moved into sustainable farming, which again just shows that people knew what they were asking for. And when they had access to the resources that they, that they needed, they were able to make a switch from from being in a trapped situation to being able to provide for their families both health and income. So the impact of just this one site is also pretty, pretty incredible. We have found um, through some different carbon studies that this one site holds the same amount of carbon that would be released from a year and a half of New York City pollution. So there's, there's a lot of importance and um, necessity to this site existing. And we've even observed orangutans using our reforestation site and moving back and forth. So in 2015, our camera traps captured 295 different uh, wildlife sightings in our reforestation site. Um, orangutans, long-tailed macaques, leopard cats, greater mouse deer, Malayan civets, and wild boars, among others. And we just love our orangutan selfies, like we call them. <laughs> So what's next for the program? This is an image of the hospital that we're working on right now. It's 68% complete at this point. And this will be both an incredible opportunity for this community to have access to a wider range of care. Particularly, we'll be able to offer surgeries and operations out of this facility, which are some of the biggest drivers of logging in that they are so expensive and they're also often an immediate need. But in addition to that, this will be kind of the manifestation of this model, and we'll be able to continue doing research out of this facility. Um, qualitative and quantitative surveys are underway of the local population, and we'll begin to really understand what worked here and what didn't so that we can start looking for other places to take this model and other communities that might benefit from our understanding of radical listening. Um, so we've already started looking at the training that can happen out of just this building, plus other partners and sites that we can go to around the world. And I want to talk about some of the key principles that we've learned from this work. After almost a decade, I like to just bring them all up. <laughs> After almost a decade, we believe that radical listening to identify the problem really working with people to find holistic and comprehensive solutions and then keeping communities involved at every step is what we believe has made this so successful. And we found that it's not only people in this area that care about this rainforest, but it's people around the world. And we can all work together to help the people on the ground connect with those who have resources, time, and skills to protect this place that matters to all of us. And we hope that you will join us. We love working with the Blank Park Zoo, and we hope to continue to do so through the Austri Kids program and other conservation efforts, and just continue to work through funding and grants and communication efforts to keep spreading the word about this story and this model, and hopefully 
save the whole rainforest with a stethoscope. So thank you everyone for being here and I have, I think, plenty of time for questions. And Bethany's here to answer questions as well. She's our research director. Yes, that would be amazing. And I actually, when Jeff was sending me the slides about, the, um, about all of the goat metrics, he was saying that he would love to talk to some people at other zoos about what opportunities there are for this program ongoing and then for other, other areas that we might need expertise from zoos and vets and people with animal expertise. So I think I don't know anything necessarily specifically, but we do have such a robust volunteer program and would love to work with more people on the conservation side. So I can put you in touch with him and yeah. Or also with Amy, who's our volunteer coordinator, mm -hmm. if we can put you in touch with her and then if you can communicate what the expertise is of the potential volunteers, then she can work together with you to figure out what the needs are at the site and how we can maybe fit the two together. Yeah, yeah that's, that would be great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We have some handicrafts that we sell. We actually work with a, um, an import store in Portland that sells some of the woven mats that we have. As people do barter at the clinic with mats and baskets primarily. Um, so we do have some and we could get you. If you're thinking of the gift shop here, I don't know if that's what you were thinking, but that would be outstanding. Yeah. 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 And we also have um, the conservation fundraiser, which we've spoken about a little bit, and we need auction items. Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. Also, too. brilliant yeah. idea. So, yeah. Great. That would be, that would be a good opportunity. If yeah. I'm going there in yeah. the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. so perhaps if you communicate with me, then I can be sure to bring those items back. Perfect. And then I'm here, so I can easily get them to you. That would be, yeah, they yeah. can be kind of tough to ship, so that yeah. would actually be yeah, the best solution. I could just solution. drive them to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. But they're beautiful. I mean, they're made all with um, like rattan and natural and some synthetic dyes, and they have these like bright, beautiful purples yeah. and pinks and blues and greens. They're they awesome. would be a hit. <laughs> You so should we're go based, back to the map. Yeah, okay. So we're based <coughs> primarily out of this one uh, city, but there are 25 30, yeah, communities. 25 communities so around these. this national park. It's yeah. probably hard to see, but all of the little like green triangles right and there. orange squares and everything are villages around the national park. And we um, have official MOUs with all but one of them at this point. And an MOU is a memorandum of understanding. So we go into the community and speak with the village head who then speaks with the communities themselves to talk about whether or not the individuals um, would be interested in working with us. So the memorandum of understanding essentially says that this community has committed to not logging at all within the national park and this piece of paper is their promise to us and our promise to them is that in return they'll have a bigger discount on health care um, and we'll provide other resources and s services for them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, and that's, that's with really, all of these. Yeah. And I just want to say too, we don't, we won't turn anybody away at the clinic. So even if they don't have yeah. a mem memorandum of understanding, you can always still be a patient at the clinic. But this will, like you say, access the discount system and work with some of the other conservation and health programs. Like we have, we have community health programs specifically around tuberculosis and mobile clinic programs where people from our clinic, pharmacists, nurses, doctors will actually go, yeah. I think once a month and provide as much as they can provide but out the, of a van. <laughs> the discounts to villages that have that MOU, it's an added incentive. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yeah. I hadn't actually heard about that happening that, that much. Okay, yeah, but I know that we're working with some of the other uh, nonprofits in the area to do training in villages around human animal conflict, but yeah. yeah. So Erica is our conservation director on the ground, and she, I think perhaps in the past year, year and a half maybe, has begun to work with those organizations that focus more specifically on animal trafficking, um, and poaching is part of animal trafficking, that issue. Um, so she's, I think, like I said, over the past year, year and a half, she's begun to wrap her head around, you know, what is the extent of the problem, what animals are being trafficked, um, and what, what are the best opportunities for, for solving that problem. Um, so now I think it's a discussion. Um, we haven't done anything on the issue before. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I know that because of our infiltration, for lack of a better word, within the communities, but just our connections and relationships within the communities, we've started, Osri started to become a, seen as a resource yeah. if there is a conflict situation going on. I don't yeah. know as much about poaching and trafficking, but I know people will report to the forest guardian that's in their village, like, hey, I'm having this issue with an orangutan coming into my fruit garden, and I really want to stop it, and I know that I should do this in a way that doesn't harm the animal. Can you help me connect with the people that can, that can yeah. solve this problem? So yeah. I think just because of our status as community conservation people, we can, we're seen as a connector. Yeah, and we've been there long enough. We've built a high level of social capital, mm -hmm. which means trust mm -hmm. um, in, in practice, mm -hmm. which is, I think, huge and really enables and facilitates our actions. <coughs> so. Absolutely. I mean, I would say that two, so there's two sides a little bit to the deforestation problem that's happening in Indonesia, and we are working on the ground primarily with individual loggers, but there's a huge problem with palm oil and pulp and paper companies, and palm oil in particular, the monoculture that's developing in Borneo. Um, so that is another way that we can really decrease the pressure that's being put on Bornean rainforests. I don't know if you'd add anything about that. Yeah, just I would say if that's what you're doing during Halloween, if it's possible that you can make some little educational thing to give to the kids so that kids can read it and understand what this palm oil issue is, yeah. um, the more exposure they get to what that means, um, the more likely it is that they will tell their parents and they will talk about it in school and that that concept of what it is and what it does to this location and other locations like it, the better. So, yeah. yeah. And Paul, I mean, Halloween is actually a great time because yeah, we'll be just idea. at the end of the fire season too. And yeah. that's such a direct tie if people are seeing news stories. Hopefully there'll be more and more news stories about how big of an issue this is this year. I mean, last year there were outlets calling it the worst crisis since the BP oil spill. Right, so it's, it's Primarily just how many invasive species are now across Indonesia, like grasses and, and ferns and things of that nature. And then it's, I mean, I've heard of causes of fire from everything from a cigarette butt to trash burning to um, companies that are trying to clear a new piece of land will typically use fire to do so. But if it's in the midst of the dry season, it can just spread faster than you can blink pretty much. So, and what palm oil, corporations do and specifically what corporations that hold concessions which is like a license to extract the resource right so these corporations will go in and at this point many of the areas are now um, the non-peat areas peat being a high source of carbon right within the ground a, a specific type of soil um, corporations that hold concessions have almost at least in this area, gone through all of the areas that don't have peat, and now they're moving to areas where they hold a license um, to degrade that land. And so what happens is they'll come in and they'll drain the water out of the peatland, which releases a vast amount of carbon, right? And then they clear cut the forest, releasing more, and then set it on fire. So if you can think of the three worst ways to put carbon into the air, they're doing it. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely encourage anyone to consider not purchasing items that have palm oil and spreading the message, just helping people understand what that means and how much palm oil is in everything. Yeah, it's so much beyond candy as yeah, well. I mean, you can talk about toothpastes and shampoos yeah, and I mean, other packaged treats. I mean, I and think, encouraging yeah. people to identify which corporations are being sustainable mm -hmm. and encourage them to purchase from there because the more market power, the the sustainable movement has the more effective it will be so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. palm oil is a big one it's tough to figure out what has palm oil in it and what doesn't i've seen lists of the 20 to 50 different names that palm oil can go by but the cheyenne mountain zoo app is a great one yeah. um, that helps identify what it, what it's in and what it's not in um, yeah. yeah and i think we've put out a couple resources on companies that um, either haven't done anything at all to companies that are trying and then kind of everybody in between. So I think that 
you know, comes from another source as well, but we publish that around Halloween as well and can connect you with those resources.